Good Tuesday morning, guys. My name is Jerry Miller, and this is the Jerry and Jerry Show. Thank you kindly for joining us here. It's our pleasure to connect with you. No matter where you get your social media content, this show is airing on those platforms. We are about a mile away from Scott Stadium, about one mile away from the John Paul Jones Arena in this studio in downtown Charlottesville. We encourage you, the, the viewer and listener, the UVA fan, the ACC fan, the Virginia Tech fan, to offer some questions and join us in the discussion by shaping the show, by positioning your comments in the social channels you're watching this program within. Judah Wickhauer, our director, the star of our program, is Jerry Hootie Ratcliffe, a Virginia Sports Hall of Famer, a man who's covered Virginia for over 40 years and the Atlantic Coast Conference. He knows this business and these teams and this content like the Pope knows holy water. Judah Wickhauer, if we can go to the studio camera, and let's welcome the man, the myth, the legend, a man who needs no introduction, yet I do it every Tuesday morning, Jerry Hootie Ratcliffe, my friend. It's great to sit across from you again, and we got a victory for Virginia football to chitter-chatter about. I, I like the Pope reference. I, <laughs> you're the Pope of Virginia coverage, Virginia media right here. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it always is more fun to talk about winning, right? Amen. And... Uh, I, uh, an old high school coach uh, that I knew said, said, winning corrects everything. Cures the, everything. The, the, the flowers smell sweeter. The birds sound prettier when they chirp and sing. And uh, he's right. I mean, it's there's nothing like winning. And certainly it was a long time coming. And uh, considering that, he, uh, Tony Elliott, had been harping on to his team about getting that first ACC home win. Uh, it took a little longer than he thought it would, but uh, it certainly was a fantastic win over Duke. Uh, Duke's not a bad football team at all. They're pretty darn good. And, uh, Very good. At one point we were talking about them possibly being in the ACC championship game. So uh, it, was a, it was a really good win. For Virginia, and, and I thought they, even though the score might not indicate it, uh, as we were talking off there, I, I felt like they dominated the game and the line of scrimmage most of the day. I thought I thousand percent concur. Um, I understand it's a three point victory, but Virginia dominated this football game, and it starts under center with Anthony Calandria taking care of the football. Um, I'm not one for hyperbole or cliche, but this youngster, over the course of his first campaign in Charlottesville, seems to have matured very quickly. From many interceptions in a, in a road loss to Maryland, uh, to throwing into double, triple coverage, red zone interceptions, fumbles, taking off your helmet late in a football game. What he did against Duke football was what you would see from an elder statesman and not a first year under center. Very poised, very collected, played, uh, just made really good decisions with the football, played a very intelligent football game. And I think they probably saw this coming in practice a little bit because they see him on a daily basis. And it, it's tough for Calandria. I mean, he's a freshman. We're, we've seen the maturation of a freshman quarterback right before our very eyes. and. All the mistakes that you mentioned, and I asked him after the game Saturday night. I said, "It looks like the game has slowed down for you." And he said, "Yes, it has slowed down. Uh, I'm more cognizant now of, of you know, entire situations: when to run out of bounds, when to slide, when to take a sack, when to throw it away." not forcing the ball quite as much. And, and that's hard for him to do. I know uh, Tony Elliott and Des Kitchens were both asked after the game. They said, uh, it seems like Calandria would be hard to manage because he's got that Brett Favre gunslinger attitude. And he feels like he can force anything into a six by six window or something. Biggest strength and biggest weakness. Yeah, and uh, so the, they, as Kitchen said, they, they don't want to restrict the kid because that's part of what makes him really good. But yet he has to play within their parameters, and he's starting to do that now. And it's a shame that he did, didn't have that kind of experience under his belt when he got all these opportunities. But that, that that's part of the growing pains of 
of a freshman quarterback. Uh, Dylan's Rule watching on Twitter. Thank you, Dylan, for uh, liking the show. Viewers and listeners, give us a tweet, a retweet, and ask a question wherever you're watching. Johnny Ornalis, we were just talking about Guadalajara before the show started. He's one of the owners of Guadalajara, his ownership stake in the Jefferson Park Avenue location. He's one of the co-owners of El Mariachi and Zion's Crossroads, and he is launching a new restaurant, Mexicale, on West Main Street, which will open at the end of December. So three restaurants under Johnny Ornalis' belt. He's watching the program. Your fans in Texas watching the show. Fans in Maryland, Richmond, Short Pump, Crozet, Greenwood, City of Charlottesville, right down the street in Belmont uh, and Northern Virginia on the broadcast. Look, Calandria is a guy that uh, oozes confidence yes. and oozes, as you said, moxie. And he's a guy that people want to follow and want to play for. And, and what I found that really encompassed that statement was in the postgame coverage he was already talking about beating Virginia Tech in the post-game coverage this first year. Uh, he's got the, the looks of a movie star or, or a California surfer. Um, he has got swagger, and he was reveling with the, within the uh, locker room uh, of, of in, the, in the shadows of this win and already talking about beating the Hokies, my friend. I imagine he'd be a fun guy to hang out with. Absolutely. <laughs> that's, what I, I, that's a perfect statement right there. Yeah. Uh, but you're right. He, he does have the swagger. And even though he's from Florida, it, it seems like a, a Cali swagger. But he's, uh, he's a very confident young man. He, even though if things aren't going well and, and if he's not playing, he still keeps his confidence. He, he never gets down on himself or down on the team or anything. I, I think that's one of the reasons. They've got a lot of guys like that in this program now. Some of them came from elsewhere. But this team has stuck together through everything. Uh, they've had a lot of adversity, and the fact that they haven't – that you know, a lot of teams at this point of the season, beginning last week, would have given up. They would have folded. And this team never even gave that a thought. They, they've stuck together. They've been determined. They've played hard. And they wanted to go out with some wins. And who's to say that they won't? I, I know Tony Elliott brought up at the end of – his press conference the other day when I asked him about getting the ACC home game hump off his back, and he said, "He said I was told that uh, it's been since 2003 that Virginia, since a Virginia team has won its last two home games." So um, I think he's thinking in the right direction as well. I, I I would assume that if he ends the season with two wins, beating Duke and Virginia Tech back to back. That would make up for a lot of previous faults throughout this season. I 1,000% agree with you. Not only make up for uh, previous faults throughout the season, but give the fan base, the coaching staff, and the players a very important feeling of hope um, going into next year. The, the upside is there. You have a quarterback that has gained valuable experience in his first year and has potentially three more years on grounds. You, you, you return a wide receiver um, that's got some upside next year. You're going to have to find someone that's going to replace arguably one of the greatest wide receivers in UVA history, and Mr. Washington, and we'll, we'll get to him in a matter of moments. you got uh, talent on this roster. They're going to have to obviously you know, replace some openings through the transfer portal. Um, you've highlighted on this program, Virginia's going to have to prioritize NIL and figure out ways for these guys to make some money with their, their image, their name, and their likeness. Uh, and I think that's in the works. But there is an opportunity for the fan base, the players, and the coaching staff to say, look, we got something we can build on. That may not have been the case after year one. Anywhere you want to go on these topics, Hootie. Yeah, well, especially after... So many guys left the program after last season because obviously they didn't buy into the program and didn't think they were going to fit into this system another year. So a lot of them got out of Dodge. And some of them are having success elsewhere. Some of them I, I don't know. But uh, this this team does have a lot of upside. And, and I'm I, you know, talking to Calandria after the game, he was already politicking – to try to uh, advertising, I guess, to the transfer portal 
which will be coming up, I guess, uh, four days after the conference championships. Uh, it'll be a four-day window after that. Uh, he's already advertising for wide receivers and uh, at mm -hmm. least wide receivers, along with other people that he can throw to the next right. three years. So there is a, a lot of upside. They they do lose some fairly experienced people in, in certain spots, but they have a lot of young guys that they have worked into the mix out of necessity more than anything else, and, and a lot of them are playing well, uh, led by Big Cam, uh, who's a stud. an incredible linebacker. He's, yeah. he's the kind of linebackers that Virginia used to recruit. Yeah. And so, Who's he remind you of the past? Uh, he can well, cover. He's athletic. He goes sideline to sideline. He can hit. He can play the run game. He can play the pass game. I mean, he at, at many times throughout the season looks like the best player on the field. Yeah, I, I think if if Poindexter had stayed at a line a free at a linebacker spot instead of a free safety, he reminds me of him just the way he plays because he's smart. And like you said, he, he's a great run defender and he can pass cover, which a lot of the really good linebackers they've had in the past, some of them couldn't do that. They, right. couldn't, they couldn't do go out one-on-one -on -one with a tight end or something. Can I throw out a name to you yeah. and, and have you uh, pick apart the comparison? This guy I made a living on Sundays for the 49ers. 49ers, your football team. I've known you well. Uh, Ahmad Brooks. Ahmad Brooks, yeah. Yeah, Brooks... Brooks, Brooks was a beast. That. Yeah, he could do that. He was a very talented guy. Uh, and he, he did that with the 49ers for a while as well. He, he could go into pass coverage. A little bit of a head he's case a bigger, Brooks. I think he's a bigger dude. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So probably doesn't have quite the speed that Cam Robinson does, but uh, still was he was a pretty complete linebacker. Yeah, Mod Brooks was, was, uh, was an animal. He Ari was. Brown's here, uh, <laughs> he and he was a guy that put a lot of fear into uh, offenses and offensive coordinators. We'll highlight Edward Jenkins watching the program, Greg Redfern watching the program, Holly Foster's watching the show, and Henrico. Viewers and listeners, let, let us know your questions. Um, put them in the feed. We'll relay them live on air. The Who fans outside Philadelphia watching the show, John Snow watching the program. John, good uh, morning to you. Um, Malik Washington, I mean, where, where do you begin here? Malik Washington against Duke, absolutely dynamic. He's got uh, two touchdowns, a buck 12 through the air, eight catches. I mean, average, what, 14 a catch? Um, obviously, they're targeting, they're making an effort to target him, yeah. as they should. Um, another convincing performance by Malik Washington, uh, eclipsing 100 receiving yards yet again, finds pay dirt twice, making a statement yet again for arguably the best season by any wide receiver in UVA history. Open any question. Where do you want to begin with Mr. Washington? He's a coach's dream. Uh, not only is he a great athlete and a, a good leader, he's a great classroom guy. I mean, he was all academic Big Ten for at least three years, the last three years, and I'm sure he will be at Virginia as well. Uh, listening to Tony Elliott talk about when he and Des Kitchens visited him, I guess, I don't know if, it, if he was home or, or back up at Northwestern when they visited him, but he, um, they said uh, we, we were amazed that everything in his apartment was in place. What does that uh, mean? Uh, everything was organized. There was nothing out of place, nothing junked up in his apartment. It was pristine. Wow. And, uh, I, you know, I, I can't even do that. <laughs> I can't do that either. Uh, but, you know, that it gives you a little insight into, into what he is. And in the, listening to the coaches and Calandria and even to talking to Malik after the game, he he was telling these guys, Coach, I want the ball. Give me the ball. He, he never, he's never said that really before a game to Tony Elliott. And this time he said, Coach, I want the ball. Give me the ball. Give me the ball. Uh, he kept telling Calandria in practice, uh, throw it to me. If I'm open, throw it to me. I'll catch it. If, even if I'm not open, throw it to me, and I'll catch it. And he does. He does. He, he's, it's unbelievable. The guy's always open. Calandria said it's crazy watching – 
he'll go back and watch practice film after practice that night on his laptop or whatever. And he said, the guys, it's, it's just crazy. He's always open. He always finds a way to get open. I'll give you the season stats. Are you ready for that? Yeah, he, and, it's and unbelievable. Hootie, Hootie knows these inside and out. I mean, he, he knows this team better than anyone. 96 catches. He's still got a game left, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. He's got 96 catches, 1,311 receiving yards, nine touchdowns. Malik Washington, the 5'8", 194-pound wideout from Georgia, is averaging 13.7 yards per catch. I mean, it is absolutely one of the best offensive performances, individual performances that I've seen cover, following this football team. I followed this football team for – my dad went to UVA. My brother went to UVA. I went to UVA. We grew up orange and blue. I remember being knee-high to my dad, going to Scott Stadium, watching games on TV, going to University Hall for basketball games. How do you characterize this individual performance, this season performance for Malik Washington? You've mentioned Herman Moore last week, a bit hesitant to put him in the same category as Mr. Moore. Um, and, and I echoed what you said because the difference with this season versus Herman Moore and Sean Moore and Terry Kirby and a hell of a lot of really good guys was they were winning football games. This team, not so much. Anywhere you want to go here. Yeah, well, it is. I mean, he has rewritten almost every receiving record at UVA. And he doesn't have the size of a Billy McMullen or a Herman Moore or a Heath Miller, some of the Jermaine Crowell, some of those guys. But, I mean, the guy's just good. He's, he's just got a, a nose for football. Like I said, he, he, he runs great routes. He, he has great instinct. He has great hands. He can – run with the football. I mean, his yards after catch are crazy. And he's got, uh, I think I said he has good speed. He, he probably is the fastest of, of any of those guys that we've talked about. There are some things that he might not be able to do, like McMullen and, and Herman and Heath, and the fact that they were taller and better they could leapers. Go out and jump they, could, people. they could out-jump people. Yeah. But, but uh, this guy has everything else and then some. Uh, he, he's had the single greatest season of any receiver in UVA history. And he's knocking on the door in the, of the top ten in the ACC, I think. He's just uh, a gift. I mean, to get a guy like that through the transfer portal, is, especially here, is incredibly rare. This is a tough question for you. He's so confident. I, I mean – He's just unbelievable. He's had a great year. How, here's a tough question for you. You got a guy who was a proven commodity at Northwestern and who had the grades. He's, this guy's an academic. Yes. Coming from Northwestern. As you've highlighted, an all-conference academic type performer. How did he find his way to UVA? How that's did, that's is, a good question. I don't think anybody has totally explore, explored that. Um, is it the 5-8? I, I, think, I think, well, that might be part of it. Um, and Northwestern was a little under the radar. They didn't have a great year. I think the academics here probably attracted him as much as the football team. And he probably saw an opportunity football-wise that he could come in and make a difference. And we said, you know, you never had a 100-yard receiving game at Northwestern in, in all those years, even though – you did have some 90-yard performances. He said, well, I, he said, I always knew I had all this in me. I just had to dig down deep and, and, and get it. And that just shows you what kind of kid he is right there. He, he doesn't believe that anything is impossible for him. And the fact that he's done it, con considering that he's had to work with two different quarterbacks, get used to two different – Two completely different quarterbacks, really. Um, Calandria being a freshman and go, going through those growing pains with him, because I'm sure there were times where he probably was open and Calandria couldn't get him the ball for whatever reason. Um, I mean, he's number two in the nation in almost every category to the neighbor's kid from LSU. We've talked about that before, and, and he has a Heisman Trophy candidate throwing him the ball. 
uh, and some other, a lot of other receivers and running backs to take some of the pressure off. Washington knows that defenses are going to game plan around him. Oh, my gosh. Uh, Malik Fields uh, has had a couple of really good games the last couple of weeks, and that, that has helped take a little pressure off of him, attracting. I like Fields. I do, too. He's, he's terrific. And uh, uh, Sudarian Harrison made two huge catches in that final touchdown drive Virginia made the other day. And if he can continue that this week, that, that'll help a little bit too, take some of the pressure off of Washington. But uh, the fact that he's had to overcome all this stuff and still had the season he's had is, is a fairy, fairy tale. Um, John Snow watching on Pantops. He said Herman Moore was the absolute best. Um, oh, he was. There's no question. I, yeah. I, you, I mean, you knew him I well. Know him, still know him well. Yeah, and, right. Uh, we talk a couple of times a year, but he's Herman was unbelievable. And, and like we said, he, he proved that at the next level. He went on and, and did things that only Jerry Rice was doing at the time. So that shows you his greatness right there. Uh, trivia question for you. He, this guy knows football here. Who was uh, Herman Moore's quarterback with the Detroit Lions? Oh. That was a blast from the past right there. <laughs> and you may, you may, we may have to double, double check this here. I, wasn't it Rodney Pete? Rodney I, Pete I think and he An was one of them. And yeah. Andre Ware? I think Andre Ware was for sure. Uh, quarterback from Houston. He played yep. college football at Houston. Yep. Pete, obviously USC. Mm-hmm. Um, they had a pretty dynamic offense that, that Detroit – Barry Sanders? Barry Sanders was in his backfield. Yeah. And the, maybe, maybe the greatest running back of all time. Right. Retired Certainly early. One of the best. Yeah. Absolutely. Retired too early, I think. Absolutely. Absolutely. This question's come on the feed from Thomas. He says, ask uh, Hootie if he thinks uh, Washington's going to be playing on Sundays or if he has a chance to get drafted, and if so, if so where? I, I think I by think- where he means round. Yeah, I think he'll definitely get drafted. Um, what round? I don't know because, uh, I mean, he's a slot receiver, and and those guys make a can make a good living in the NFL. Uh, he doesn't have to be one of those guys that is always going deep. Um, I, I don't know what round because I haven't looked at the draft boards lately. I, I don't do that until he gets closer to draft time, but I, I mean, you've got to be crazy if you don't consider drafting this guy, because, you know, pro football, you, you got to have a great quarterback, you got to have a great pass rusher, and you've got to have at least one great receiver, if not several. Yeah. And, I mean, receiver, this is the the era of the receiver 100%. right now in the NFL and as much as they throw the football and you can never run out of have enough good receivers. So yeah, he's, he's definitely going to get drafted. Uh, I don't know who all has declared for the draft at this point. So there may be some juniors that might be perceived ahead of him because of size or, or whatever, but, um, he'll definitely get drafted. I think it'll be relatively early. I, I don't know that he'd be a first rounder, but I think he'll get drafted fairly early. Uh, I'll throw this to you: comparisons for Washington for known commodities in the slot from the National Football League. I'll throw the name Wes Welker to you. Wes Welker was unbelievable. I'll throw I'll throw uh, Mr. Lamb, the wideout for the Dallas Cowboys, to you. Mm-hmm. Um, any of these tickle your fancy for a comparison? I will not, will not, will not throw Tyreek Hill because I think Tyreek Hill's in a category of his own. C.D. Lamb may be a comparison, although C.D. Lamb could be a bit more explosive uh, than Malik, and that's not taking any, anything away from Malik Washington. C.D. Lamb is one of the best. Who does he remind you of? I, I, would, I would think Lamb is somewhat of a comparison because they could move him around everywhere. He's, he's a thorn in the saddle of every defense they play. Uh, these guys are huge for football teams because, you know, it's, a lot of times the defenses will, will sit on on these wide receivers and not let them get deep. 
unless they make a mistake. And, and it's the guys like Washington, the slot guys, who can run any kind of route and are such a pain because you, you, it's hard to contain these guys. And uh, I, I think his best football might be ahead of him. 100%. That was my next question for you. So, you know, I think a lot of times these teams will draft off potential in what they see. And considering the year he's had, I don't know how many scouts have seen him this year. I haven't seen a ton of scouts at Virginia games. But I would think if they're drafting off potential, he's he's got to be <coughs> – hot on the somebody's board because I think he has an unlimited ceiling. Yeah, and, and think about this. If you are making a case for Malik Washington to play on Sundays, the guy goes from Northwestern, which is not like it's the upper echelon of college football, to UVA, which is not the upper echelon of college football. In his final year, he's had multiple quarterbacks. He's had a coach in the second year of implementing a new system. He transferred, yeah. so he's playing for a new coaching staff. His, his quarterback is a first year right now, literally a freshman. My next statement to you was his best football is way ahead of him. <clears throat> the only knock potentially in Washington, and I'm not even sure this is a knock because we've seen smaller guys have success in the NFL, is maybe the height, but in the slot – that's not necessarily an issue because right. you're looking for people to get in and out of routes quickly, more concerned with good hands and creating space and running tight routes and, and getting separation than height when you're playing the slot, anywhere you want to go on this. And, and that's exactly what he does. That's what makes him who he is. Plus, like we've said 20 times before, he has good hands. He's smart. <coughs> And NFL, the NFL really likes smart guys if they can find them. And his yards after catch is, is I mean, that's a very valuable asset in the NFL. If, if you can catch most of the balls you're targeted on, have good speed, get open, catch the ball, and then break tackles and run to the open spaces, that's, that's a huge benefit for any receiver and any offense to, to have those kind of weapons. And there's not a lot of those guys out there. Uh, John Snow says Heinz Ward. Uh, I love Heinz Ward, a Georgia Bulldog right there, guy yeah. who played some quarterback, a uh, guy who returned some kicks, guy who did a lot for the uh, Steelers. His son, a diehard Steelers fan, love you, Scott Ratcliffe. Uh, I think you probably woke up this morning, Scott Ratcliffe, and pretty pleased that the offensive coordinator got pink slipped. I don't want to speak for Scott, but oh, you did saw he? that. I, I hadn't heard that. He yet. got pink slipped, the OC in Pittsburgh. I'm shocked that it took that long. I, I, I was shocked as well. Tom I'm shocked I, that they hired him in the first place because he's been fired everywhere he's been. Right, right, right. Uh, I, I respect the comment of Heinz Ward. I, I don't see perhaps the comparison with Heinz Ward. Heinz Ward, a uh, taller, more physical uh, type of wide receiver, um, where Malik is um, – Malik seems to be the prototypical slot for me. Um, so, yes. I, I, you know, I think the future is very bright for this young man here. And, and I don't think we should underestimate the academics piece of this. Playing in the National Football League undoubtedly is about explosive, good hands, athleticism, catching the football, running great routes. But there's a tremendous intellectual side for playing in the National Football League. And this guy completely understands the intellectual piece of anything he does. Um, so props to him. Multiple folks are asking for your take on Calandria just to break him down. We've talked about his moxie already. This is a great question from Grayson, who's watching the show. What does Hootie think that Calandria needs to improve upon? And you know, before we go there, I, you brought this up, and I've talked to so many Virginia players who have played in the NFL, and all of them will tell you that People in their organization really value the UVA smarts. guys because yeah. they're smart. They they make good decisions. They don't make a lot of mistakes, and they can figure things out. So that that's another uh, feather in his cap going forward. Um, Who's the smartest football player you've ever been around? That's the toughest question I've ever asked you. Well, the smartest person was probably Tom Burns, a linebacker here, who. Uh, was studying nuclear 
science and, and stuff that I can't even pronounce, but he went on and became a, uh, a nuclear scientist guy. He was, I think he's made a fortune down in South Carolina working for some company of that ilk. And, uh, but we did a story on, he was the, the uh, national scholar athlete by the national football foundation one year. And, uh, uh, I remember we did a feature on him, and we got him to take some of his uh, books from his classes and stack them up in front of him for the photo. And we were reading the titles of the books, and it was—he <laughs> I mean, re- he, he would read Einstein stuff for for uh, pleasure reading. <laughs> smart guy. He was a smart guy. Uh, How about we throw a little Ronde and uh, Tiki Barber in Ronde there? Ronde and Tiki were very smart. Thomas Jones was very smart. Um, uh, there were, there's been so many of them. Um, I'm just trying to weed through all these years. And I'll throw this to you. Um, I mentioned earlier in the program, my brother and I went to uh, UVA, and my parents took us to Charlottesville um, to give us a taste. I mean, they would take us throughout our lives. But as we got uh, closer to college age in our high school years, we got more serious about taking tours, not just going to Scott Stadium or U-Haul. We would take tours of the academic buildings. My dad, a McIntyre School of Commerce graduate, so we would tour the McIntyre School of Commerce. And they, uh, this was, good night. This might have been like 97, 98, dating myself here. Uh, They had the majors of uh, the McIntyre School of Commerce graduates, the concentrations, the concentrations. So you had uh, the folks that were, uh, you know, advertising, marketing, uh, various forms of business on a board and with their average salary. And the board had an asterisk on the bottom and says, this does not include Rondé and Tiki Barber who signed multi-million dollar <laughs> contracts in the NFL. Both of them McIntyre School of Commerce guys, those yeah. guys. I mean, yeah. absolutely fantastic. I was always impressed with their smarts. I mean, that was something that probably was never written that much about, but uh, we knew the people who covered them knew how intelligent those two guys were. And, and I mean, just look at what they've done off the football field. Uh, Children's book authors, I mean, broadcasters. They, yeah, they've done everything. Uh, Tiki even has been on Broadway for goodness sake, and uh, Rondé is into all sorts of activities. Both those guys have been huge successes, uh, both on and off the football field. Uh, James Watson watching the program. He's a UVA graduate, love James Watson. He said he spoke with Antonio Clary last night, and he's a smart young man, uh, and he's already finished his master's and has another year of eligibility remaining. Yeah, and I think he's coming back, if I, if I read that right. Uh, I think he announced that last week or two weeks ago. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of these guys are really intelligent, and we don't get to know them as well these days as we used to when we used to get to see them multiple times a week and sit down with them for 30, 40 minutes instead of uh, just a few minutes like we do now. But uh, there's so many of these guys, and I, I go to a lot of these. I, I kind of help the Virginia – alumni football club uh, with some publicity and some of the people that they honor. And so I I get invited to some of the tailgates and some of the reunions. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, Al Grow had a reunion for uh, all the area players that played for him. And they came from all over the state, even from outside the state, just to have lunch with him that day. And so I've, I've gotten to know a lot of these guys after the fact, after football, and so many huge successes that, the, that these guys have had uh, out of football. And, and it's part of it was how they were raised and all that, but part of it, a lot of them overcame a lot of things, poverty in some cases, and have gone on and had incredible professional careers in, in whatever field they chose. So uh, that's one thing. When uh, And I don't know if Virginia uses this enough when they're recruiting, but I think they ought to use a lot of these guys who have gone on to success in, in the recruiting. And, and when they say it's not a four-year decision, it's a 40-year decision, I, I don't know if they stress that enough because if you're around these guys that, that I see from time to time, 
it's it's unbelievable what they've accomplished in life and part of it's that education they got here and and just the growing up in this university around successful people um john i will get to your comments here in a matter of moments leslie and kelsey i'll get to your comments here jennifer's watching in richmond she's commenting i believe they're watching at their law firm right now wahoo's everywhere if you have a question for the virginia sports hall of famer put it in the feed and i will relay it live on air anywhere you're watching social uh, this show on social media we love your comments calandria is all over the feed right now yeah uh, people love this guy the question multiple questions uh, i'll just throw it to you kind of rapid fire to get you to you know, your thoughts on Calandria, what he needs to improve upon has come on the feed. Uh, Cal Calandria is he the clear-cut starter next year has come on the feed. Do we expect Musket to return with Calandria exploding like he has has come on the feed right here? Um, what can this football team do to give Calandria more options next year is on the feed. So a lot of questions here for you on a kid that, as you said, has he's a Florida kid, as we know, but he's got that Cali swag. Um, I follow him on Instagram. I mean, his Instagram's fantastic. I just love this kid's moxie and upside, and he seems to be a foundational piece to build a program around. Yeah, no question. Comes from a great family, too, down there in uh, Central Florida. But I think he just has to keep doing what he's doing. Uh, just keep his nose down and, and work hard. They, they work with him constantly, not just on the field, but – in the film room, he's shown a lot of growing up in the past couple of weeks, had uh, incredible numbers, and probably should have a couple more wins under his belt, really, if things had worked out a little better. And, and part of it maybe was his fault for forcing some things before he finally learned. And, and I, again, we've talked about this before, if you're a a quarterback, you've got to make so many snap decisions. You, you've got to take the play, come up to the line of scrimmage, see how many people are in the tackle box, see where the safeties are, uh, read your receivers to whether you think that you've got somebody one-on-one -on -one with a mismatch. you got to decide whether to keep that play if it's a pass or, get, or check off to a run or to another play, then after the ball snapped, if everything goes well, you've probably got 2.8 seconds to find your receiver, and if he, the first one's not open, you got to find going and read your progressions with somebody trying to knock your head off. And so that's a lot for a freshman who's used to dominating high school football like he, he did, where you, you could use your athleticism and your arm and, and, and everything to – get out of a lot of situations and run the football like he does uh, as opposed to where he had to has to think more and make more decisions so I, I can see why he was making a lot of mistakes early it's it's only natural and we've seen so many quarterbacks struggle with that it's rare to see a, a true freshman come in and be an overnight success they have to go through the maturation and that's what he's doing I think he'll just keep getting better and better I, I I hope he doesn't lose all of that gunslinger mentality because that's made him a dangerous quarterback. The Maryland coach is early on in the season said he reminding, reminded him of a young uh, Tagovailoa that, that he coaches. And uh, he was, I don't know where he is right now, but he was preseason Big Ten quarterback of the year. So uh, that's a pretty that's a hell incredible comparison, comparison yeah. after the, uh, what, the third game of the season? Right, but, right. Um, and that wasn't even his best outing. No. Far no, from no. it. Far from it. Yeah. And But you could see that there was so much potential there. And that's why the coaches recruited him, even though he wasn't that highly recruited. I think he only had one other F seriously power five offer. Which is another shocking yeah. tidbit. Yeah. I mean, guys like that slip through the cracks sometimes. And uh, I, I don't know who discovered him for Virginia, but hats off to them because they, uh, a lot of people were sh shaking their heads and wondering. He said, oh, this guy's not that big. And if you look at him without his pads on, uh, he's not that big. Uh, no, so he's not I, that I'm big sure at all. A, a year in the weight room is going to help him 
a lot. But, I mean, he can run with the football. He's got a golden arm. He's fearless. He's confident. He's smart. He's got everything you're looking for in a quarterback except maybe five or six more inches right. to his frame. But right. he makes up for that in other ways. Was he six foot? I mean, you've, you've stood next to uh, Six not, foot uh, standing on the uh, yellow pages? No, I don't think so. Would, would you 5'10"? 5'10", maybe. Yeah. 5'11", maybe. I yeah. don't know. But um, it doesn't bother him. No. So if it doesn't bother him, it shouldn't bother anybody else. But I, I think if he just keeps doing what he's doing and, and takes coaching, the game is going to continue to slow down for him. And that's going to make him even more dangerous because he won't be making bad decisions. And that's all you want from a guy is somebody that won't beat himself. And that's what he was doing early on. And now he's not doing that. And the one thing that he showed us last week was that he could win. Uh, he's had other great performances, 300 yards, so many touchdowns, et cetera, et cetera. All that's fine, but if you're not winning, it doesn't matter. But last week he showed us he could win. And that's what you want to see in a quarterback is somebody who can lead your team to victory. And if he can do that again this week, like he was talking about in the locker room, um, I mean, next year could be a lot of fun. Uh, Rachel Allred watching the program, and she's in Syracuse, Utah right wow. now. Uh, thank you kindly for watching the program and giving the show a like here. Viewers and listeners, if you have thank questions, you. we'll uh, put them on the feed right now. Got some questions coming from the Washington, D.C. area about Virginia Tech. This one's a good one um, for you, Hootie. Uh, Laura, thank you for watching. I think she's in the Georgetown area, what her profile says. Virginia Tech on the schedule. The Hokies, this is a big one for them because they're trying to get bowl eligible. What are, your what are your thoughts on Virginia closing the year with two straight wins and what they have to do to beat a team that I utterly despise? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure she's not alone with that in the Virginia fan base. <coughs> Excuse me. I, I think Virginia just has to keep playing the kind of football that they have been playing lately. I mean, if, if they were playing like this, Jerry, at the beginning of the year instead of the tail end of the year. It would be a completely different season. They would, be, they would have already qualified for a bowl game. Yeah. So th this team is a bowl-worthy football team right now. It hasn't been all year. But they're playing – I mean, you just look at what they've done. They beat Carolina and ranked number 10 in the country, undefeated, and – beat them bad on their own home field. And sort of uh, the research that Virginia's coaching staff did exposed a lot of weaknesses on that Carolina team that everybody else since then has been blueprinting. They created the blueprint. Yes. And they have used Virginia's game plan against Carolina. And uh, same, uh, Clemson used some of that the other day in, in that game. Um, they they did that. They took Miami to overtime. Could have easily won that game. Could have beaten Louisville on the road, which was ranked 11th in the country. And now it's moved into the top 10, I think. Uh, they had a hiccup against Georgia Tech, and I still can't figure that one out. Uh, they just weren't ready to play that day. And that was their worst loss of the year for me. Worst loss of the year. They they couldn't yeah. do anything right that day. Yeah. I'm sure they'd love to have that one back somehow. Boston College, three-point loss. NC State should have beaten three-point loss. James Madison, one-point loss. Should Maybe have won that game, really. Should have beat JMU. Maybe you chalk it up to the weather delay. I do chalk it up to the weather delay. With the momentum switching. Yeah, completely changed that game. Yeah. Um, and then beat Duke, who's had some really good wins this year. So I would think if they uh, – since they're at home, I know the – the series is lopsided. I, it's hard to even call it a rivalry the way it's been over the last 25 years. Uh, last time they won in Blacksburg was 1998 under Aaron Brooks and some of those guys and Thomas Jones. Uh, they've only won twice since then. I think Al Groh beat them once here and Bronco beat them once here in 2019. So it's it's so lopsided. It it's hard 
to give Virginia the edge, even though they probably should have it. And for some reasons, and, and I've covered both programs. I, co I covered Virginia Tech early in my career. And even during my time here, I've, I've covered some Virginia Tech games. Uh, not a lot, but quite a few. How far is Pulaski County from Blacksburg? About 30 miles. Yeah, he grew up in Pulaski County. Mm -hmm. So um, I've, I've always had the impression, and I never could figure out why, that Virginia Tech seems to get up more for this game than Virginia does. And, You're saying fan bases and I've seen, or players? I'm, I'm talking about the players. Okay, okay. And maybe it's because more state players go to Virginia Tech than here, or at least in recent years, but hadn't always been the case. But I've, I've always gotten that impression just from covering both sides of the, of the equation, and I've never quite been able to figure that out. I, I don't know that that will be a, a difference. I, I know we, we talked to some of the guys here, and they, somebody even asked Calandria this the other night about the rivalry, and he said, oh, well, I don't know much about the rivalry. I'm, I'm learning. Um, I'm sure that Chris Slade and Clint Sinem will educate them this week on the rivalry. Uh, I'm sure Tony Elliott and his staff, uh, other than those two coaches, probably didn't know that much about the rivalry either. And uh, they, they do know what it means to Virginia fans and to Virginia Tech fans. So it, it's hard to pick Virginia in this game until they prove that they can win two in a row against the Hokies. Uh, and the fact that they've had them on the ropes so many times and let them off, you just kind of expect bad things to happen. And uh, how can we ever forget Broncos' last game here when Virginia had them beat? You're talking offensive line first throwing and, the ball. First and goal inside the 10, and Robert and I calls a tackle eligible play to a 315-pound guy who was – would have had by the time he caught the ball, he would have had to run 15, 16 yards through the Tech defense to score a touchdown on the fourth down with uh, everything on the line: State Pride, uh, Commonwealth Cup, all that stuff, recruiting advantages, etc. How could you make a play call like that? It's the worst call I've ever seen in my career. Wow! By anybody. Wow! Uh, on any level high school, college, or pro. And I've covered all three of those extensively. He doesn't far, make, he doesn't make statements like that lightly. No. And it, it was just the dumbest thing I've ever seen. I, I, nobody could believe it. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, would, I would still give Virginia Tech the edge coming into this week because you can say, well, they have one advantage in that they're playing for bowl eligibility. They have to win this game to be eligible. But that's also uh, you got to look at it from the Virginia perspective too. They can ruin Virginia Tech's season if they knock them out of the bowl, which would be almost if you're a Virginia player and a Virginia fan, that's almost as good as going to a bowl yourself as knocking Virginia Tech out of a bowl. So this is kind of Virginia's bowl game this weekend. Um, Virginia's backs are against the wall. Tech's backs are against the wall. I don't think there's a lot of difference in the two programs in terms of talent. Uh, Virginia's playing maybe better right now oh, than Tech. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Uh, Tech got beat at home by a so-so NC State team last weekend. Led by? Led by Bren uh, Brendan Armstrong, who finally got a win over the Hokies. <laughs> he had to go somewhere else to do it. Who but, accounted for four touchdowns, Brennan Armstrong. Two yeah, in the air, two on the ground. Probably his best game of the year. For sure. And uh, so th there's a lot of reasons you could pick either team and, and feel good about it. But there's just something in, in the back of my head. And I know uh, Foster, their defensive coach for years, would get his team so fired up for Virginia. He had his way of doing that, um, and Beamer uh, and Fuentes after that allowed him to, to – there's no holds barred that week, and, and they, he would get his team more fired up for Virginia. I don't know if they have that kind of 
mentality now that that they had when Foster was there, but they just seem to get up for this game more. So I, I think the ball, the the burden falls on Virginia's coaches and Virginia's players to get more mentally prepared and motivated for this game. Great take from Hootie. We'll give you the uh, line again. Three points, depending on where you shop, a 2.5 to 3-point favorite Virginia Tech. It's a 3.30 kickoff. Um, I agree with everything the man said. This is Virginia's bowl game here. This is a great way to finish the season with two straight wins to build momentum into next year. The over, over under at 51 and a half. This is an important contest for recruiting. This is an important contest for fan pride. Uh, what do you think of the fan turnout against Duke? It was pretty bad. Uh, I, maybe their worst crowd of the year. I'm not sure. I'd have to go back and look. I, I know they said there was 36. Not a chance in heck there was. No, it wasn't 36,000. Yeah. There's probably 36,000 tickets sold. Right. But uh, a lot of empty seats. Even right. the, a lot of the students didn't show up. I, I don't know if part of that was because they were on break or what. But uh, I don't think the students, when, when and I, maybe I'm dating myself again, I'm 2000 to 2004 here at UVA. Hootie, we were camping out for basketball games in yeah. nasty weather and tents. Yeah, it was like Krzyzewskiville out there. Right. We were camping out in tents. We didn't miss a football game. We were all over the hill, there early, there till the end, partying hard in the stadium. Yeah. I, the, and I'm not trying to throw shade here, but the student body does not seem to have the same passion for football as we've seen in years past. Is that solely attributed to winning and losing? Probably, I would think. It, it, although, for the most part, up until this past Saturday, I, I thought they had pretty good student turnout. They didn't always stay uh, to the end like you, like your guys did. But at least they were there at the beginning and through the first half. But yeah, I mean, I, I'm I'm sure that recruits notice that when they come for visits that. Hey, what happened to everybody? <laughs> Where'd they go? <laughs> or where is everybody? That's that's uh, we've talked about that so many times, and and I don't know what the solution is other than giving away free tickets or cheap tickets to get more f fannies in the seats. You worried about the the hokey turnout? Yeah, I'm sure that there's going to be Saturday? tons of Virginia Tech people there because I mean they travel well. They travel well. Uh, you got to give them credit. They're they're a pretty good fan base. Although we saw what can happen to a fan base as rabid as that one when you're losing. I mean, they they they've had a couple of years where a lot of people didn't show up at, to their home games. Not recently, but they give credit to them. They've had sellouts, I think, all year long. But that, that's important and. Uh, especially in recruiting because I'm sure there'll, there'll be a ton of recruits here on Saturday. Oh, yeah. And I'm sure a lot of them are trying to decide whether they want to go to Tech or UVA, uh, in-state recruits. And the fact that some Virginia kids have been playing well this year and, and the fact that they got a four-star like Cam Robinson to turn down Tennessee and Florida State and some other football powers to come here and – He's flourishing, having a great year, one of the best freshman years in the country. Probably should be a freshman All-American uh, on whoever does those teams. Uh, the, all these things are important and part of the culture that, that makes a football program special. And, I, again, I don't know what the solution is other than winning, but even sometimes winning hasn't been enough here. There's Go back to that. Uh, year when Notre Dame came in here and they couldn't sell out the stadium. Notre Dame sells out pretty much everywhere they go, uh, especially when they're a top-10 team like they were that season. Uh, memory serves correct, Jay Wolfolk, the starting quarterback. Yeah, Armstrong had his ribs broken at BYU, BYU two weeks before and yeah. just couldn't go. But, but still, just the fact that your team is – 
playing well, playing for winning season, playing Notre Dame at home. You would think there'd be some excitement uh, enough to show up for a, a night game, if I recall. The weather was nice that night. Um, shouldn't have been any obstacles other than the fact that a lot of people didn't think Brennan was going to play. But, I mean, I, I, again, I don't, I don't know what the solution is other than giving away tickets or selling cheap tickets to, to try to get more people in the stands. What's a 3.30 kick on Saturday? ACC Network, Virginia and Virginia Tech, the Commonwealth Cup. We'll watch that game closely um, inside Scott Stadium. Um, let's see how this game plays out and how the season finishes. Uh, we, we will talk basketball. I'm seeing the comments all over the feed. Uh, disappointed Wahoo fans after last night's contest against Wisconsin. I started the program by saying they did not get off the bus. Um, 65 Wisconsin, 41 UVA, their first loss of the season. I think the upside for this basketball team, uh, much like Mr. Washington, uh, the wide receiver, um, is significant. I think Virginia basketball is going to be playing its best basketball into 2024 and is still finding um, – its identity because it's got a boatload of new players um, that Tony, I mean, I'm not even sure. And, you know, Coach Bennett is walks on water as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm not even sure Coach Bennett knows his um, starting lineup or has identified a starting lineup um, yet. I think it's still a work in progress. I'll start open ended. Um, Wisconsin came in at two and two. They're now three and two overall. This was a butt whooping yesterday. It certainly was. And, I watched the press conference that Tony participated in after the game. I didn't see any panic in Tony Bennett's eyes. Oh, no. Size. Yeah. Uh, he knows that he, he likes playing teams like this in the early season because it prepares him for what counts most, and that's the ACC regular season. And – Something that Greg Gard, the Wisconsin coach, said afterward really struck me big time. He said, we played Tennessee and we got our asses kicked. And we played Providence and we got beat. And we played two very physical basketball teams, two quality basketball teams. And we would not have been in position to do to Virginia tonight what we did had we not played those two games and gotten that experience. That's what Tony Bennett is getting out of last night's game. Yeah, sure, it was a pounding, and it exposed a lot of warts. So did the Florida game that they managed to pull out. But he learned a lot from that game last night. And going forward, it's going to help him build this team. He told us back in Charlotte a few weeks ago, he said, look, this is not going to be – the same team at the end of the season that you're going to see in November and December. We've got multiple players who can start. We can. Uh, there's a lot of things this team can do. And, yeah, I mean, certainly it's going to be a problem, the fact that they don't have tons of size. Um, and, and Jordan Miner is a step slow, and he hasn't that. gotten the pack line defense down yet, no. and that's keeping him off the floor. Jordan Miner looks, and 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 maybe he's maybe, a big dude. He's he's a big guy. He he is the physical presence that Virginia is going to need, especially come ACC play. I mean, Duke has got the Duke big man is a pro. Um, Miner looks maybe two steps slow here. Yeah. Do you attribute that to athleticism like some of the fan base is saying, or do you attribute that to the man having to think too much because he doesn't intuitively know the pack line defense yet? Probably a little of both. Um, and Blake Buchanan, 6'11", he's going to, you know, another, a year in the weight room right. is going to make him a different player going forward. But right now, he's just not – he can't handle a lot of the physicality that's going on. That's why Leon Bond – redshirted last year he said I don't think I'm ready for the physical tests of power five basketball and and he's a different guy now oh yeah and Dunn obviously is a different 
guy, even though he played last year. It, it they're you know it's going to be hard for them to match a team's physicality like Wisconsin. I don't know how many teams they're going to play this season that will have that kind of physicality. I mean, you got to consider that Wisconsin had almost everybody back from a team that did well in the NIT last year. I think they had 92% of their scoring back. Virginia had like... Beekman. 20%, <laughs> maybe 20% of their scoring back. Um, McKe- uh, McNeely was coming off... Uh, an injury. He seemed to move well. I'm not sure he was 100%, but he played okay. Um, some of the other guys, the newcomers, just didn't play that well. I, I don't think that some of them were used to that physicality and had a tough time adjusting to it. That's something that Tony has their attention now. I'm sure in practice today that he'll be working on that a little bit. You can't correct it in 24 hours before they play West Virginia tomorrow night. But it's part of the learning process. Just like we talked about the maturation of Anthony Calandria, uh, this basketball team has to go through the process as well. A lot of these guys in March were on other basketball programs or in high school. So they've got a lot of growing up to do. And, it's, and that's why Tony doesn't get really upset about early season losses. I mean, this is November. It's November. It's November. I mean, I, I, who was it? By, which coach said nothing matters before New Year? I don't know, but he was right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but you know, it, I, I would encourage Virginia fans not to be like the Dr Pepper commercial where they uh, start burning their gear and. Oh. knocking stuff off the tables and screaming and giving up. And, and that was after the first play. Now, I'm certain that they're not like that, but just because you get beat really bad in a game doesn't mean that the season's a 100%, wreck. 100%. And Especially when Bennett, when Coach Bennett has told the fan base it's going to be a work in progress. Yeah, I mean, he, he He's given staff, us the heads up. The, these are smart coaches over here. They've seen it all. They've done it all. They'll, they'll figure it out. It might take a while. But they'll figure it out. They always seem to. Uh, I don't. I can't believe this year would be an exception. And again, they've got guys on this team who can score. And you couldn't tell it last night, obviously. But it's not going to be like that every night. Coach, they, these, these guys are going to get better and better. And they'll probably be playing their best basketball when it counts most. James highlights the difficult nature of their out-of-conference schedule. And, 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 and Mr. Watson's 100% right here. I mean, they got West Virginia on Wednesday. It's the, it's the back end of the Fort Myers tip-off. They got Texas A&M in the ACC-SEC Challenge. They got Memphis in Memphis yep. on the 19th of December. I mean... This out of conference schedule is no joke. Oh, not at all. And then the ACC schedule is no joke. Good lord. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Tony knew what he was doing when he, he had these games. He approved these games, and he likes to be challenged. And he believes that seeing all these different kinds of styles of play, physicality, finesse. Um, perimeter teams, inside team. He's kind of running the gamut here and seeing everything that's out there to get him ready for the ACC because he's going to see a little bit of everything once conference play begins. He's just not going to panic and worry about getting beat or getting beat bad. I mean, we've How many times have we seen this over the years where Gonzaga wore them out one year? Um there's been other teams. Uh, I mean, who will ever forget that 35-point loss at Tennessee that year? I was there at that game, and it was humiliating. And then they turned it around, and they ended up in the NCAA tournament, went to the, uh, I think, the Final Eight, and was should have won, gone to the Final Four, except they collapsed. But uh, he's not going to panic over getting beat bad in one game. Or even if he – he might lose to West Virginia, Texas A&M, and Memphis, but that's not going to break his focus on this team. And 
or his confidence that this team can be good. It's He's been there so many times. He knows these games, while they count, they don't – they don't mean anything when it comes to the big picture. Um, Sean Singletary tweets this last night. The uh, former UVA, one of the best point guards in Virginia basketball history, says, if you can't score, you won't win. Right. And Virginia basketball had one player in double digits, Reese Beekman. Beekman had a fantastic statistical performance, 17 points for the floor general, seven assists, only two turnovers, he also had four rebounds and two steals, shot 50% from the floor, two of three from downtown, and a perfect three of three from the stripe. Outside of Beekman, McNeely had nine, six for Dunn, Rody five, four for Groves. No one else scored. I got to highlight Rody, the transfer, who was one of the most prolific scorers in the nation, albeit at a different level of basketball last year. What's going on here with Rody? And it's early in the season. I'm not jumping to conclusions here. Is the, is the pace of the game moving a little faster than he's used to? I'm not seeing the same scoring prowess we saw from him last season. Yeah, I mean, it could be. It could be an adjustment that he's going through. A completely different level of basketball. Although Tony Bennett will be the first guy to tell you that it doesn't matter what level you play. If you're a player, you're a player. And... Certainly, there's a lot of evidence to, that, to bear that out. I, I think he's just maybe struggling a little bit with the transition, but I think in time it will click. Um, Groves, I think, seems to be having a, a better transition because he was playing Power 5 basketball. Right. He's performed well on that level and has the confidence that he can do it again. Um I, th I thought Harris would give maybe give a little bit more in the point department than he has, but uh, maybe that'll be coming too. But uh, they took Buchanan out of the game last night, and that hurt because they virtually had no inside presence on both ends of the floor, and it cost them big time. And that's something that they've got to correct. And, again, part of that is maybe getting minor up to speed as a result, they're out-rebounded by 10. Uh, Wisconsin, 28 boards, UVA, 18. That's a difference there. Uh, that's, that might have been halftime. Uh, they got beat like they, – I think they got beat like 41 to 28 on the boards. Let's see. Uh, um, 30, uh, 28, Wisconsin, eight, 18 uh, for, the, uh, for the Wahoos here. Minor, minimal minutes. Um, and minor, he finishes with – Hootie, 14, let's see here. He finishes with four minutes against Wisconsin. Uh, the, whatever that stat is, your reading's wrong. It, it was uh, 40, 48 to 21. On oh, board. you're right, it, 100%. You're 100% yeah. right. That's the halftime stat. Good call, yeah. Hootie. Uh, now, they were, they were just killed on the boards. And I think uh, Wisconsin had almost as many offensive rebounds as Virginia had total rebounds. I think they had 20 offensive rebounds, which led to 12 second half uh, second chance points. But um, if you got no inside presence on offense, that makes it difficult, more difficult for the wing guys to score because uh, you can't, you, you know the. The thing is to draw the ball, the defense inside, and kick it to an open receiver. And, and if they're not, uh, if they're not respecting your inside game, and you, you, they take that away from you, and that means if you're an outside shooter, you got to be on your game big time to be able to score at all, let alone consistently. What do you think of the West Virginia matchup? It's interesting. I, I know West Virginia is not at full. Speed because they've got a couple of, uh, from what I understand, fantastic transfers that are still waiting for el their eligibility to be cleared or for their transfer. Uh, I, th I think they've uh, had some appeals for some of their transfers that haven't been approved yet. Uh, I didn't get to see much of the SMU game last night because I was uh, writing, but uh, it sounds like West Virginia's got a pretty talented basketball team, and they usually do, even though 
Bob Huggins is no longer there. One of, my, um, one of my favorites. I know he's got some personal issues, but one of my favorite coaches. <laughs> yeah, he's an interesting dude, that's for sure. Um, intense. Definitely intense, but can be laid back as, as well away from the game. But um, I, I think West Virginia is a pretty good basketball team. I, I'd say it's probably a pretty even matchup. Um, we'll watch the game, guys. It's a Wednesday uh, basketball game right before Thanksgiving for Tony Bennett's bunch. You got any crystal ball predictions before we, we sign off here? On that, on this, on the uh, basketball game? Maybe UVA, Virginia Tech, and West Virginia, UVA. Uh, and I know you, you, you probably want to throw a little info out, don't you, on the uh, Olympic sports? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, uh, the men's soccer team has uh, won their first round game. will be hosting this weekend, Sunday, I believe. Um, go out and support George. He's been here forever, bleeds orange and blue. Uh, the cross country team didn't perform as well as they had expected on their own course last weekend. So uh, I know they expected more from their guys. Uh, women's basketball is off to a good start. They're playing in the Cayman Islands uh, this week. I wish I was on that beat. Same. <laughs> I'd love to cover that. Uh, and uh, what else we're we talking about? Field hockey uh, lost at the national semifinals to the eventual champion. Um, I can't rem remember what else is going on, but uh, all sorts of sports are, are, are finishing up or, or have finished up. Um, I, I really don't have a prediction on the, the Tech-Virginia game. Again, uh, I think Virginia's playing better right now, but again, I go back to that Tech always seems to find a way to win this game. And Virginia's got to prove to me that they can win and make it a rivalry again instead of just finding ways to lose. And that's that's what's happened so much in over the past 20-some years. Virginia's either gotten blown out or had Tech on the hook and let them off. And so they – until they prove to me that they can shake that, I would have to give the Hokies a slight uh, edge in this game. And Virginia's going to have to play almost a flawless football game, I think, to win. But again, it's it's their bowl game. They've got home momentum now. Um, they've got a lot of things going their way. They they know they can knock Tech out of a bowl game. But still, they they've got to prove it to me that they can do it. There you go. Um, I think you'll see a better Virginia basketball team tomorrow night against West Virginia, 6 o'clock, Fox Sports 1. Um, I, I don't think it'll be a physical mismatch like it was last night. I, I'm not sure we'll see too many more of those, maybe a couple more, but uh, not to the magnitude that we saw last night. Wisconsin's a good basketball team. They're, they've got – they're figuring a lot of things out as they go, just like Tony will. They they both came up under Dick Bennett, so they they know they know how to use these games to their advantage. So I I would just I would think Virginia will probably win tomorrow night. I wouldn't be shocked if they lost, but uh, I expect them that they'll probably win. Jerry Ratcliffe, guys, absolutely on fire today. JerryRatcliffe.com, the website. I am on Jerry Ratcliffe every single day. Viewers and listeners, visit the website, JerryRatcliffe.com, for anything UVA sports related. It is fantastic coverage. Hootie, um, I wish you the best on Thanksgiving. Um, Thank you. Same to you and to our guy, Judah. Absolutely. Judah Wickhauer, the director and producer of this, this talk show. Same to Judah as well. Um, we're excited for basketball season. Um, go Wahoos. We'll uh, watch the, uh, the West Virginia matchup tomorrow, and all the viewers and listeners on the many different states that are tuning into this program, we support, we, we appreciate your support and viewership and listenership, and thank you for asking fantastic questions. You really helped shape the show. Wish you the best on Thanksgiving. It's a fantastic time to be a college sports fan, this little hybrid period where both basketball and football are happening. For Jerry Ratcliffe and Judah Wickhauer, my name is Jerry Miller, and this is the Jerry and Jerry Show. So long, everybody.